So first we have Dr. Karen Holcomb. Dr. Holcomb recently completed her training as the climate and health postdoc with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. As the postdoc, her research focused on integrating climate data to improve predictions of vector-borne diseases. She's now a biologist at the CDC's Division of Vector-Borne Diseases and will focus on prediction and control of bacterial vector-borne pathogens. Um, and after Dr. Holcomb, we'll hear from Trevor Riley. Trevor is the head of public services at NOAA Central Library, and he leads the library's research services, which he established in 2017. Trevor has integrated best practices and evidence synthesis into the services processes, and he continues to explore and develop literature search methodologies in an effort to provide NOAA researchers, analysts, and decision makers with the best available science. Trevor is currently collaborating on the first NOAA-led evidence map, which is on the topic of nature-based solutions. He is also currently leading the development of the R package site source to give researchers the ability to analyze the impact and utility of research sources and methodologies. So with that, I will hand it off to Dr. Holcomb. Take it away. Thank you so much for that introduction and thank you everyone for tuning in. I'm excited to get to talk to you today about part of the research that I did while I was on the postdoc that was mentioned, the NOAA CDC postdoc. And I'm happy to share this presentation with Trevor, one of the awesome librarians at NOAA Central Library. So to start off with, I want to introduce you to a variety of the different faces that I got to work with across the postdoc and across eight different agencies from the Global Systems Laboratory and Climate Prediction Office of NOAA, as well as the Division of Vector-Borne Diseases at CDC. And my position was there in the middle to bring together researchers from all across these different agencies to collaborate and work together for cross-agency introductions to climate and health. And I wanted to take this moment to introduce you to the new postdoc who just started a couple months ago. So he was coming in with a great background in climate sciences and is happy to jump in and continue collaborating in this space. So keep an eye out for him. He will continue to be doing amazing things in this position. So the overall goal of this cross-agency collaboration is an ongoing collaboration to bring together expertise from NOAA and CDC. And the postdoc position acts as a bridge between these to bring together their um, information on climate sciences as well as those experts on climate and modeling everything. And then on the CDC side, we're bringing together experts from vector-borne diseases, so mosquito-borne disease experts, as well as the health side of it. So bringing together these disparate data sets and expertise together to jointly improve the prediction of climate-sensitive diseases. And for this, I'm gonna be focusing on those diseases that were spread by mosquitoes. Since uh, between the period of 2004 to 2016, the number of diseases caused by these insects of mosquitoes, ticks, and fleas has nearly tripled during this time period, and it is continuing to grow since then. Diseases that mosquitoes spread are those like West Nile virus, dengue, malaria, chikungunya, and fleas can transmit diseases like uh, flea-borne typhus as well as plague. And ticks spread diseases like Lyme disease, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, Babesia, anaplasmosis, ehrlichiosis, to name just a few. So there's a large number of diseases that these insects can transmit to humans. And climate has a big impact on vector-borne diseases because it largely impacts where these uh, vectors can live and how fast they can replicate. So as we increase temperature, these insects, mosquitoes, fleas, ticks can develop faster. So we get larger populations. Also at higher temperatures, viruses can be spread faster. 
increasing the risk to humans if they get bitten by one of these infected animals or insects. And also with climate, we have the increasing habitat for these different species. So for an example, for mosquitoes, as it rains more, we get more water standing around the mosquitoes can lay their eggs in. And therefore we get larger populations of mosquitoes in different, in different locations and with the potential to transmit their diseases to humans overall. However, climate is not the only impact on vector-borne disease transmission. It has a large impact overall. So that led us to our original question to motivate this scoping review that I was working with NOAA Central Library for this, was how and what climate data are being used currently to predict and estimate human cases of mosquito-borne diseases? Kind of as a understanding a baseline, where is climate data being used? How are there any gaps? Where do we need to go from here as we continue on? So I collaborated with Trevor on this process and it was a very clear multi-step process with lots of different inputs back and forth. And I'm gonna walk you through a couple of the steps from my side and then Trevor will talk more about these steps in his process from the librarian side. So we first met and talked about what were those terms and elements that I was looking for in my literature review. So being able to understand and communicate what exactly was I looking for. And then Trevor took those terms and developed some terms and extractions and strings that he could utilize for searching different databases, which then led into topic modeling to be able to group and understand strings overall. We then met again to confirm that the strings he had developed were actually representative of what I was trying to understand, as well as identifying which databases would be most likely useful and beneficial for searching to get the most data and reports from that. He then went and took those syntax strings, put them into the various different databases to export all of the different uh, articles, which he put into EndNote, did some tagging, deduplication, et cetera, and then gave that bibliography to me to screen. And I was using the Swift, Swift Active Screener platform to do this. And I was going to give you some snapshots of what that uh, looks like from the reviewer side and how the process goes along. So when I went into the, my platform, I could click on review these articles and I click on this one as an example and it pops up the title and then the abstract for that article. And then I can either click, yes, I want to include this reference or no, I don't want to include the reference based on what I'm seeing. And you'll notice that there's some highlighting in here. We put in some important words. I put in all of the mosquito-borne disease names and pathogens, as well as climate variables to include. So these can get highlighted and popped out easier to see as I'm screening. So I quickly don't have to read every single word, but I can get the gist of what I'm seeing just by looking at the words that highlight. So let's say I want to include this article in my plat in my bibliography future. I click yes, and then it expands out an optional field where I can add some tagging metadata so I don't have to go back and reread this article later to figure out what was it talking about. So I'd click on whichever diseases would be most appropriate here. This would be Japanese encephalitis, and then any of the meteorological variables that I had set out, I can click so we can tag this article for later and easier to understand what exactly was this article talking about and what sort of meteorological data was it utilizing. And then as we went through, there are multiple different metrics that the platform also shows, which are very helpful for me as the reviewer to understand how far am I through the process, what sort of metrics am I seeing that I'm getting throughout this. So I took this screenshot of the very end of where I was screening. We'll see that of those articles that I had screened, almost half of them I had excluded and the other half I had included in there. 
And you'll notice that I didn't screen all of the articles. There was still a big chunk of that pie circle that I had not screened yet. And this is due to the way that the Swift Active Platform works to as an adaptive screening tool, where as I'm going through and screening and including or excluding articles, the algorithm reassesses the likely importance of various different articles as I go through and puts the more important ones at the top and puts those that are likely to be excluded down at the bottom. So as we're going through, it continues to update and sort the various different articles so that I don't have to look at all of the articles that I go through to be able to identify those top inclusion ones. So we'll see that that red diagonal line is kind of predictive of what would have happened if I had just taken a big stack of articles and then gone through just from the top without any adaptive. But the blue line with the adaptive screening, I was going through articles much faster in order to get to the number of articles to include in here. And I wanted to provide you with a snapshot of kind of what were the results that we found from that bibliography after I was done screening. There was a variety of different uh, diseases, chikungunya, dengue, Japanese encephalitis, Rift Valley fever, West Nile virus, yellow fever, and Zika. Some of these you may be very familiar with and others you may never have heard of. The most common ones that came out were dengue and West Nile virus. And then on the meteorological variable side, a large number of articles were uh, utilizing precipitation and temperature data in their predictions. And as I had mentioned in the introduction, these are two of the most important variables that we would initially have thought would be uh, utilized to predict West, uh, West Nile virus and other mosquito-borne diseases due to their impact on the vector life cycle and transmission of diseases. There are a variety of other different meteorological variables that we also identified, and some of them we were expecting to be important in this as well. So after all of the articles were screened, we then put these into a Zotero bibliography, so it's freely available online, and we'll drop the link to that Zotero library in the chat during this talk so you can have a chance to look at it. But we wanted to make this available as a starting point to identify what sort of climate variables do we have for interested um, researchers either at NOAA or elsewhere to get a taste of what sort of research is being done in this space. And I'll note that we're just focusing here on some of the mosquito-borne diseases and those mainly that were happening in the U.S. as well as some global. We did not capture all of the mosquito-borne diseases like malaria. We also didn't capture any ticks or fleas based on the um, strings that we were utilizing for pulling the various different bibliographies and articles throughout. And as we got to the end of this project of the scoping review, there's been a variety of different light turned off. Um, there we go. A variety of different um, future directions and unanswered questions that this scoping review brought us. We'd love to be able to go through those about 800 articles that made it into the final library and look at what were the actual data sources? Where were these researchers getting their climate data from? Where are they? Models, reanalyses, observations, and did this vary geographically across the US? Were they utilizing various different processing techniques from taking the climate data to input it into their models? And were those accurately done based on the understanding and caveats that come with all of those climate data? Are there areas that are lacking data or need better connection between the climate data and then the public health side of it? As well as being able to identify is there a better climate variable or data source that is most predictive for mosquito-borne diseases predictions? Is there value added for different covariates or not? Where can we go from here and continue strengthening these relationships between the climate side and then the public health side overall?
And I'll um, stop here and hand it over to Trevor so you can get a, a sense of what it looks like from the library inside. All right, awesome. Thank you so much, Karen. Um, I have to say it was a pleasure being able to collaborate with you. And um, I just want to say extra thank you. It's, it's awesome to be able to present with you, not only to see your work, but also to be able to share kind of the back end um, and how uh, we work it from the information side of things. So um, the research services at the NOAA Central Library um, provides NOAA, NOAA policy analysts and scientists um, with information gathering support for evidence-based decision-making and scientific inquiry. Our research service librarians are information specialists, and we develop extensive search strategies, uh, which are required to conduct thorough reviews. Um, our research librarians work alongside research teams in order to contribute that knowledge and searching expertise to find information that address those specific research questions. Search strategies developed by our teams are, are conducted to be are developed to be uh, thorough and um, and can be tailored to whatever needs um, to be assessed rapidly or or thoroughly. So um, our process and methodologies ensure a transparent, reproducible, and, um, and thorough literature review. And we'll get into a lot of these methods. Um, really excited about today's presentation. So thank you. Um, our website here, um, I want to point out before we um, get ahead is uh, the link is going to be dropped in by Shannon. Um, I'd recommend anybody who's interested in the services after you've heard about them today to jump in and take a look um, at everything that we can provide. So um, anything from scoping a project, assisting with those uh, search strategy development, um, literature screening, citation management, um, and more. So there's also a nice little testimonial video put together by our team and past clients of the service. So you can get an idea of what value past clients felt um, our service added to their work. So yeah, for this, the purpose of this presentation, just um, touch upon the different parts of the, the process. Um, and again, the research question um, being focused on that weather data and the prediction of vector-borne diseases. Um, I'll be covering how we scope projects specifically this one, and search strategy development, uh, concept and keyword billing, text mining for key terms, um, search string analysis, um, topic modeling as a method for speeding up the review process, and then also touch upon uh, Swift Active Screener, which again was that machine learning um, uh, uh, screening tool that Karen mentioned. So, First thing when um, working with the No Central Library Research Services, um, we have a simple request form on our page. Um, really all you need to do is jump onto our website, provide a brief overview um, of what you need, um, and we'll get back to you as soon as, uh, you know, uh, as soon as we can. Normally that's within one to two days. Um, and then we work with you on a scoping document. Um, that scoping document is really where we do a deep dive into your research needs. Um, we really use this document um, as an asynchronous uh, project page where we can ask questions, get clarity, and our team starts to build um, a strategy before we even meet with you the first time. So again, this is one of the first things that I did um, leading up to my, our first meeting, Karen and I's first meeting. Um, and we build that into what we call a search strategy template. So the search strategy template is um, an internal process document that was developed by our team. Um, it ensures the transparency and reproducibility of our searches. Um, it outlines the critical information from the scoping process. So this could be what resources to include, what limitations of, the, of publication periods, what are the gray literature needs, or are, is gray literature even being sought? Um, it's really a learning and educational tool, both for the client, the subject matter expert, and then the research librarian, the methods expert. Um, the research librarian is able to outline our process using this template, talk about the technical details of potential searches, 
how syntax needs to be translated, and also show how strings can be tested um, with different keywords. It's really a prov uh, collaborative tool between the subject matter expert and the research librarian. Um, and um, the librarian takes everything that is in that initial scoping document and brings it into here to break things down into concepts. So, for example, the screenshot here was some of the first initial work that I did after getting Karen's um, request and her scoping document. So, again, like breaking down the categories and concepts of the research questions. So, first, you can see that anything highlighted there in red is focused on the mosquito. Um, anything in the in the orange there is virus related. Um, yellow is on prediction and early warning, and then green is that weather variable data. And right, so we're trying to scope out how a, how a question is actually going to turn into a, um, a search string. And then we have questions and notes, and you know we're we're constantly asking asking about you know synonyms and what the what the question really is because sometimes when a question is asked um, there's more detail um, right that there's inclusion exclusion doesn't necessarily come out in that first um, round so then we go in and start building search strings right again this is about looking at synonyms other terminology that is potentially included in in the literature so you can hear see here that broken it down into both that prediction section this is just a small screenshot of some of the search string testing um, and then the climate observation and variables um, the search string is developed iteratively um, and this happens through both conversations with the subject matter expert but it also comes in um when we start running text mining so um, this for example is the output of um, some text mining through the r package lit searcher um, a really great package where you can upload a corpus of literature um, an ris file or a, a bib file into the r package run it through um, and extract keywords from both title and abstract and so you can take a look at this with subject matter experts, understand, you know, what are some of the key concepts that potentially were missed or some of the keywords that are being pulled out of the literature. And the, you can do this um, with, normally it's, it's better to have more literature, but you can still do it with a small handful of literature if there are benchmarking articles available at, at an early stage. So, one particular interest that I have as a methods expert is increasing the efficiency of the literature review process while maintaining that high standard associated with evidence synthesis methodology, the transparency, bias reduction, reproducibility. Um, the, the processes inherent in evidence synthesis can be extremely time consuming. So developing and testing rapid evidence assessment methods is really exciting. So for this project, I had the opportunity to explore the use of topic model modeling in order to both improve search string development, um, as well as to make recommendations on how the literature may be pre-screened um, before going into that swift active screener tool in an effort to save time. And so knowing that uh, Dr. Holcomb here would be the only uh, subject matter expert working to screen these articles, as well as knowing the fact that um, this work wasn't necessarily um, being used for a formal evidence in this project. I was able to experiment a bit. Um, so I want to explain this heat map here. Um, it's a little difficult to read, um, but these topics that are outlined in yellow, the, um, the text, are actually various topic models based on a corpus of literature. Um, those bolded lines, um, which you may be able to see, um, there's topic 41, 43, 45 are all bolded, as well as these three down here. Those are specific topic models that were that fit very well within the parameters of the research question. Um, the numbers that you see along the side, this is actually one only one of the types of um, uh, heat maps that Swift Active Screener can create. That's actually um, over time the number of articles 
that were published which meet those top which fall into those topic models so you can see the red is actually um where there's a heavier number of larger number of publications and the green is less so um i believe this was split up over um so maybe 20 years um, with a range of two years um, per uh, per cell. So looking at this, you can see a number of things. You can see kind of trends in publications in particular areas. Um, and then what you can also do is better understand how well search strings are resulting in relevant articles within these topics. So from the initial roughly 3,200 results, from that initial strategy, um, we developed 100 topic models. Um, selecting the relevant topic models, um, we, it resulted in identifying about 2,200 articles from that 3,200. So we went, we went ahead and did more title and abstract text mining on those 2,500 or 2,200 articles and further were, was able to further refine our string. So um, this was um, one of our initial search strings and after the second round we actually tightened it up a little bit and really focused more um, in some of the predictive areas so after we ran a second round of topic modeling we were able to find that it reduced the number of articles down to about 1500 and once we selected the particular topic models that were relevant in this case it identified almost all of them as being relevant, which was really nice to see. We had a better understanding that our search string was um, was being um, redeveloped in a, in a better uh, fashion. So, um, <clears throat> combining text mining, um, the, the, the lit searcher, our program, with topic modeling was another one of those things that I really wanted to experiment. And um, it, it was really nice to see how they work together, um, being able to extract specific references and then rerun them through LitSearcher. Um, so that was really nice to see. All right, so then once we had the six, roughly 16, uh, what was it, 30, oh gosh, I don't have the, total number on here, um, one number I forgot to put on here. Okay, so once we had the final number of records though, it was about 2,500 articles, um, and put them into Swift Active Screener, um, it does have a really nice, robust um, recording feature. So we can see um, this bottom chart here is actually Karen Holcomb's uh, work to screen all the articles. So you can actually see the amount of um, screening that was done across time. So this is just a little calendar. And, um, and, and so you can see that, you know, over, over this amount of time, um, she spent 24 hours in real time screening articles. Roughly 12, almost 13 hours was uh, screening articles she ended up including and just about 12 hours excluding. Um, it breaks it down on how much time um, a user spends looking at the title and abstract of each art articles. So again, a little more time um, paying attention and, and being decisive about that inclusion article, 52 seconds per title and abstract versus exclusionary. Easier to see those for the most part. Um, and then in terms of number of records re reviewed, we can see again, they're about even except for the number that is not screened. And so when we were calculating this, we can say that if she were to screen all the articles, it saved her, again, roughly about 24 hours, uh, you know, a little over a day of nonstop screening, right? Which, if you look at the calendar, right, she didn't screen all of that within, you know, a week or two. It took about three and a half months. Um, people are busy, people are doing other things. So this is a, just another one of the tools, again, that we work to provide. Um, and you can see that, that saved probably about three and a half months worth of screening. Um, so Swift Active Screener is an active learning tool. Again, it's, it's a form of machine learning and it prioritizes literature based on the prior inclusion or exclusion. Um, you can also seed the um, software with initial set of articles. So if you have you know, 20, 30 articles, you know you would include um, in the end. 
you can actually set those as seed articles to begin the process. Um, so the Swift Active Screener can build an initial algorithm and off the bat, you're going to start seeing more of the relevant articles and the screening process will be faster. All right, so this is a little bit of a, a bonus. Um, did some analysis on actually the, the um, efficiency of the databases. And so this is, again, one of the things I'm very interested in because research um, is, is such a time intensive process because um, there are so many different resources out there, but also just you know so many articles out there, it's really important to understand where someone should be using their time searching. Um, and really there's no tool out there. Um, over the past year, I've been working with a group, um, Evidence Synthesis Hackathon, to build an R package to actually look at this. Um, so in, in this particular case, um, analyzing four of the different databases um, that were used, Lens, PubMed, Scopus, and Web of Science, you can actually start to see um, the use case for um, you know, an open, uh, you know, aggregative uh, database such as Lens. So initially, Lens had a lot more, right? Um, had, let's see, um, about 2,800 roughly, just under uh, resources that it brought back, um, articles, reports, gray literature. Um, and in the end, it also had the highest number of unique sources you know, only found in that database that were, um, that were included uh, by Dr. Holcomb. So um, looking at this, uh, there's a number of ways you can break down this information. Um, it's, it's really fun to see, you know, something like Web of Science, you know, having um, in the initial search only 159 of its, you know, roughly 1,600 sources be unique across these databases. Um, and in the end, only 10 unique sources coming from Web of Science, um, because it's a major powerhouse, um, you know, citation index. Um, same thing with Scopus. Um, so using tools like this, we're hoping to be able to further analyze um, the utility of resources and this tool can also review the utility of methods versus resources. So we didn't have the chance to um, try out a, a num uh, other methods. We did just searching in databases. But if you were to do citation chasing, for example, on benchmarking articles, you would be able to put that information into CiteSource. And you would also be able to see the you know number of sources that were unique to that method versus searching a database. Um, this upset plot, on the other hand, also shows what was unique to each database. So if you follow this Web of Science line across, you can see there's that 159 articles which came back in the search, matches up right here. So that's this dot here. But you can also see how many sources were crossed over with exactly what other source. So again, three sources were crossed over between Web of Science and PubMed. Um, you had 107 between Scopus and Web of Science. And then you have combinations such as PubMed, Web of Science, and Lens. So again, um, this um, will be a tool in the future to help researchers focus their time and where they search as well, depending on the type of research question they have. Um, that's all I have today, but I know that uh, Dr. Holcomb and I are uh, happy to take questions. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Trevor and Dr. Holcomb. This was an awesome presentation. Um, yeah, and I'll just reiterate, if anyone has any questions, any comments, please uh, feel free to put them in the questions box on your panel. Um, so our first question is for Dr. Holcomb. Um, so you used uh, Swift Active Screener. Um, was this the first time that you used it? And if so, was it easy to learn? 
Yes, this was the first time I had used Swift Active Screener and it was really easy to learn. Trevor gave me a little like five minute intro to what all of the different things to click on and what they do and then set me loose and it was really easy to use. Awesome, thank you. Um, and our next question is for Trevor. Um, Trevor, with you mentioned uh, two products here. You mentioned Site Source and um, talked about Swift Active Strainer. We talked about Lit Searcher. Um, with all of these tools that are available, how do you pick out which ones are the most relevant for each project? Yes, yeah, so that's that's a good question. So um, something like Lit Searcher is because you are extracting keywords from a corpus of literature. It can be useful in almost every single case um even a subject matter expert who is you know done a lot of research in a field um doesn't necessarily know you know what the entire corpus you know looks like title and abstract wise like what what terms people are using or potentially new terms people are using in their field um so i think that it that's a tool that can be used a lot of times um it's an r package but it also has a shiny app so it has a graphical user interface, a GUI, which um, can be used by the layman. Um, so it's a really fantastic package um, developed by Eliza Grains. Um, it, uh, Swift Active Screener would be something that would be used for a much large, you know, a, a very large project, something that um, you definitely need to have that machine learning piece working with you. Um, we don't always use it. Um, in our projects. And then um, something like site source is, you know, almost completely different, but would be, you know, if you're, if you're interested in understanding where you want to search or where the best place for you to search. So for example, you could take a couple of keywords based on your research project. So, you know, on this one, it, it might be, you know, West Nile, Chikungunya, and some of the other concepts and just put them into different databases that you have access to. And then you could bring that into site source to kind of analyze, okay, you know, maybe one, one database has complete duplicate, you know, with everything else. So obviously you could drop that. You don't need to spend your time there because then you're going to need to deduplicate all of those articles that you found anyway, and it can be very time consuming. So they're all used um, for different use cases. Our team is, starting to put together some documentation around research tools. So we're going to be developing um, further uh, web pages about different tools that you can use um, and utilize in your research process. Um, but you can always reach out to our, our library service if you have any questions. Thank you. Uh, we have another question here, and this is for both of you, I believe. Um, so what has been the most helpful tool in this collaboration? Well, I can start and then you can follow up, Trevor. I think really there were a lot of different tools throughout that were really helpful to identify those topic modeling, to identify, oh yeah, that is a synonym to the word that I'm trying to think of, as well as the Swift, Swift Active Screener was really great for going through all of the different articles that were pulled out and being able to rapidly identify which ones were most important and then tag them with the disease and meteorology variables so I didn't have to go back and reread them later on throughout. So those were the major ones in my opinion. And I, I would say, you know, yeah, each each tool kind of has its own purpose um, in in the research phase. I'm I'm a little um, <laughs> I'm a little biased because our team has really put together, and it's just a Google Sheet, right? But it is a template that has changed over time. But um, our search strategy template, where we can actually sit down with the researcher after we've put in, you know, four or five hours of keyword building, um, syntax development, and then searching within the da database, um, we can show how various keywords affect the number of results that are being um, uh, uh, discovered, you know, from that um, specific string. 
And so you can play around with strings. And I love how it's a, it's a teaching tool, um, both so that the you know, methods expert, that research librarian can show a researcher just how um, these databases work, how the, how the strings, you know, look like and, and what their function is, and, you know, even down to, you know, the asterisk or, you know, a dollar symbol, or, you know, things that research, you know, the, the subject matter experts, they're not in these databases every day. So it's a learning, uh, you know, tool for that. And then the other way around, as the subject matter expert is going over the search string, they're asking questions like, why did you do that? Or how did, you know, how are we getting, how are we making sure we get articles on this? Um, and sometimes, you know, that that's a really, that that's it's very important. And also looking at the keywords together um, on, on the tool, well, you know, on the template, um, that discussion that it brings forth. So um, it's, it's probably the most simple out of them. Um, it's just a, you know, a Google sheet, but it's a, it's a method that is kind of tried and true and um, continues to develop and, and improve as our team um, works with more uh, folks throughout without knowing, so. And Trevor, a follow-up question to that. Is this template available publicly or is it just something that's available um, to anyone working with the research services team? We haven't made it available like just as a as a template, um, but I would be more than happy to put together something so that um, so that people could could take it and use it. It does have some specific things related to like project timelines and everything like that that probably wouldn't be relevant if someone else just grabbed it. But um, yeah, I think that that's a really good idea. We could even put some examples up on the website. So. Um, Definitely something that we could we could work to develop. Wonderful. Okay, the next question, um, I believe, for Trevor again, how does Swift Active Screener compare to other available lit review tools powered by machine learning like ResearchRabbit? So, I, I'm not sure if ResearchRabbit is a, is a screening tool. I haven't run into ResearchRabbit. I, there are a number of other tools out there like Colander, um, uh, which, which is another screening tool. Um, when, when we initially were looking for machine learning um, tool to assist screening, the th biggest thing that stood out with Swift Active Screener is that it has, um, it has an algorithm built into it where it tells you um, when you can stop screaming. And so that was the biggest part of, um, of us choosing Swift Active Screener over other screening tools. Um, this 95% recall um, that they have built into the system. And, it, and it's documented, um, you know, there's an, an um, about how, you know, how it works. I can't get into detail now, but that was the biggest part of it. It, it is actually telling the researcher, hey, You've screened enough. You have everything that that that's relevant to, you know, at least the way you've been including and excluding articles. Thank you. And our last question here. Um, this is my question. Completely can be transparent about that. Um, for Dr. Holcomb, um, my question is just, what do you feel was the biggest benefit out of working with with Trevor that maybe you wouldn't have received if you ha hadn't worked with them? I think it was getting to see all of the different strategies that can be employed in understanding how to do literature search searches and how to refine strings throughout and understand exactly more of the literature review side of it. And it was really cool to be able to bring in his expertise into our um, postdoc position, which was so very collaborative and cross-disciplinary and agency, to be able to bring together all of those different expertise from all over to this climate and health nexus, which needs further investigations.